Hey Truthers, it's Ben here, and today I'm coming to you with another Christian critique video. I haven't done one of these in a while, and I want to get back to them because I really feel that they're good for teaching because I can just sit down and kind of go through my thoughts almost in a, in a podcast kind of way um, with, with minimal editing. And it, it really helps to, to get a, a lot of information across because I can read scripture and articles. I can kind of flesh my thoughts out, and that's what we're going to do today. And today's topic is divorce. Now, when I say the word divorce, a lot of you automatically have very negative emotions attached to this, especially if you're younger or if you grew up, you know, in the last 50 to 60 years since no-fault divorce has been legal in America. A lot of people have been affected by it. I've been affected by it. I come from a broken home, as does my wife and just about everybody I know. It's weird that it's kind of a rare occurrence for people to come from a house where there's a mother and a father who stay married, who stay in the house, who love each other and raise their kids together. And that's really unacceptable to me, especially in the Christian church. Now, when I look at the statistics out there, I see that the divorce rate in the church is about the same as it is outside the church. Now, I think there's one major reason for this. And the one major reason is that the word church doesn't really carry a whole lot of meaning today. Now, when I say church, ecclesia, when I'm thinking about the biblical definition of church, I'm thinking about saved Christians. People who have actually been regenerated, who, who have been saved, who proclaim Christ as Lord, who live it out daily, who read the scriptures. People who are firm in their foundational beliefs. But when we say church in America, it's kind of come to mean just something that people do on Sunday and not even on Sunday. It's something that people do Christmas and Easter sometimes. It's something that people just identify with because, well, you know, my parents were Christian or I grew up in the South or, you know, I think something's out there, so I'm just going to say Christian. So the divorce rate in the church is not really the same as it is in the atheist, secular, materialistic world. The problem is that the definition of church in America doesn't actually coincide with the biblical definition of church. So when I say church, I'm going to refer to the biblical definition. I mean, people who have been regenerated by Christ, who follow him, who believe his word is law. So the, the actual people who have experienced salvation, that's what I'm talking about. So when I say church, I'm not talking about the organized church, the TBN Daystar, Joel Osteen Mega Church. Well, I go there on Sunday because it makes me feel good church. The Western church. I'm not talking about that. So why am I bringing this up? Well, one reason is that, like I said, divorce in the American church is just rampant. It is offensively common to me. Now, as a person who is regenerated and has experienced salvation, the fact that Divorce is so easily accepted among Christians. Absolutely offends me. At the very least, it's an irritating thing to have to deal with people who are ignorant of the biblical text and who give horrible advice and say stupid things that come from the culture. It, you know, I mean, tell me if you've heard this one, because I heard this one. And I heard it from Christians. Oh, you're getting married? Time to get the old ball and chain out. Oh yeah, you're getting married? Hope you don't like video games. Oh, you're getting married? Oh man, looks like you're going to prison with the rest of us. Now, how many of you have heard something stupid and ignorant like that? Or you've heard something different? I remember when me and my wife had been married about six months. We went to a marriage conference of sorts. It was just a little thing that our, our church was doing. We had a small church at the time. And they were putting it on. And it was for married couples to get together, and we were talking about marriage. They said, who here has been married the least? And I said, yeah, six months, you know, because I was excited to be married. And the person almost fell apart. They were almost offended that I was so happy I'd been married six months. And that he launched into this, yeah, well, the time's coming six months when the grind's going to be here. And, man, you're going to run into troubles and temptations and all these horrible things. And I remember just sitting there thinking... How bad does your marriage suck that you think that's what everybody's marriage is like? That you as a Christian man at a marriage retreat get-together with other Christians would go into this tirade 
of how hard and horrible and the, the things you're going to struggle with. Why is that your default go-to? Because that's the default go-to of the Western church, apparently. It's just the same as the culture. There's not really any distinction, unfortunately, with a lot of people. And the reason I'm bringing this up, like I said before, one reason is that it's so common in the church today that people aren't educated on it. People are sinfully, willingly just allowing this to happen. This, you know, they say things like, well, they just weren't meant to be. Well, they were young when they got married. Well, I've just fallen out of love with them. They're not my soulmate. That gets on my daggum flipping nerves. They're not my soulmate. Uh, yeah, they are. I don't love them anymore. Who told you that love was a feeling? That That's the one that I think uh, deserves to get smacked in the face the most. When people tell me that, we're just not in love anymore. Love is not a feeling. Love is a commitment. It's a choice. It's something that you choose to do every single day. What you're describing is lust. What you're describing is a desire, either sexual or a momentary rage of emotions and chemicals in your body. That's not love. Nowhere in the Bible is love described like that. And nowhere in the Bible does it say, well, if you don't feel this sexual, chemical, kind of just, ooh, philosophical, existential feeling for your spouse, well, then you can divorce them because it must not be meant to be. No, that's not what it was. For the majority of human history, actually, arranged marriages were pretty commonplace, and that's because the parents were, for the most part, better far seeing than the people trying to get married. I mean, that's that's really weird in our culture as Westerners to hear somebody say that arranged marriages were actually beneficial to people. And people get all caught up, oh, well, it's not true love. And, you know, we get all these sappy Hollywood ideals of what love is. And then I look at them and I go, the divorce rate's over 50%. In some communities, it's 70 to 80%. You're going to sit there and tell me that arranged marriages were a bad thing? They might have been a good thing, actually, because people stayed married. One, because it was unacceptable in the culture to do that. And two, because they didn't have this weird 21st century notion of fake Hollywood love that it's just my soulmate's gonna be there for me and ooh wow I just feel this thing all the time that's not what marriage is and if you talk to anybody that's been married for a couple of years if you talk to people that have been married for 10 20 30 40 50 years they'll tell you that's not what marriage is and marriage gets better I know everybody thinks that if you kind of fall apart in the beginning and this lovey-dovey feeling goes away that that makes it worse no it doesn't marriage gets better if you and your spouse continually work and commit yourselves to each other and you work on your marriage it gets better every single day and every single year me and my wife have been married almost four years now and my marriage this year was better than the marriage last year and the year before that and the year before that and my marriage has gotten a lot better since i've had a son having a child has actually increased my attraction and my pull towards my wife that I had never experienced before. So let's look at some very modern, popular examples of why I find divorce in the church to be such an issue. Now somebody that has been in the news recently is Paula White. Now Paula White is a supposed preacher, pastor, um, spiritual aide, spiritual... What do they call her? Spirit... Let me start over. Now, Paula White has been in the news lately because she has been elected to Donald Trump's cabinet. Now, she is a supposed pastor, preacher, teacher. She's written a book uh, lately that's kind of been in the news because she's a prosperity heretic, a word of faith preacher. And she is Donald Trump's spiritual advisor who is now on his cabinet. Well, why am I picking on Paula White? Well, because even if you don't like the fact that she is a pastor or preacher. Even if you're, if you're, a, let's say, if you're a egalitarian and you don't have a problem with women preaching and teaching and standing in the the office of pastor, uh, I would obviously be on the other side of that, and I would argue that the Bible is. But let's just say for a minute that you agree with that. Paula White has been married three times. She got divorced fairly recently in 2007. If for no other reason than her being a woman disqualifies her. Her divorces and her 
wealth gain and everything else that came along with that and the the fallout due to that everything that we saw come from that she is disqualified because of that but because the church is so forgiving and just doesn't care about divorce anymore they let it pass but let me let me i don't want to get ahead of myself so i'm going to read a, a, a section from a an article in the christian post entitled paula white breaks silence on probes divorce and benny hen she got divorced in 2007, and at the time she was being investigated by the IRS for insurance fraud and for a bunch of dealings, and she was making millions of dollars, like all these other word of faith heretics, Benny Hens, Kenneth Copeland's, people like that. She was being investigated, and there was a lot going on. So this, this article focuses mainly on, on her divorce with her husband. And I should point out that when I read this, this should be the end of the conversation. Paula White... She is disqualified from the pastorate because she has been divorced. The Bible is quite clear about that. But let me let me get into the article real quick and read you a little bit. And I'll, I'll put it up on screen so that you can read it along with me. Bishop Randy, Pastor Paula, give me a word. Marry me, bury me, pay these bills, prophesy. Why aren't you doing this? Why isn't it like it used to be? We don't like the music. We leaving the church, typo. We're leaving the church because you didn't know our names and you didn't come have lasagna with us, she said. Mimicking the demands and criticism she was met with. White noted that it was under that kind of pressure and in a really weak moment that she and her husband made the decision to divorce in 2007. The split was amicable. According to White, her husband closed up to her. While she traveled the world preaching, she pondered, why can I win the world and not go home and win the one that I love? She recounted a time when Randy took her into a dark room, placed a mask on her, spun her around, and told her to find her way out. With tears... White said she sat there for half an hour, scared and calling out to him. He took off her mask and informed her that that is what he felt like he was going through. When the two announced their split, Randy had agreed to take the responsibility, and God told me to keep my mouth shut, she said. Randy, who no longer co-pastored without walls, is now writing a book, she noted, but she added, I'm proud of him. He never quit, God or anything else. The trials continued even after the divorce when White and televangelist Benny Hinn were pictured last summer in the National Enquirer leaving a hotel in Rome holding hands. They were accused of having an affair and being engaged. So here we see Paula White is obviously having issues in her marriage. So even at the time of her being a quote-unquote pastor, her and her husband, they were struggling in their marriage. And I don't know if they went out and got counseling. I don't know if they sought help from the church. I don't know if she brought her husband or he brought her before the church or before the elders or the deacons and tried to work it out. But it doesn't seem like that's what happened. They divorced. And now Paula White, who is a very prominent person in Christianity, has remarried and is now a financial advisor on Donald Trump's cabinet. And she is also toted as a pastor, a preacher, and an author. This is the person we're looking to in Christendom in the Western Church as the role model. That is unacceptable. But the reason I bring her story up is because people like her really cast shade on regenerated Christians and what the Bible actually says about marriage. This is unacceptable. And if you were to ask her about her divorce, I'm sure she would say, oh, it's okay. Or, well, we just weren't meant to be. Or, well, it was okay by God. If you were divorced, you do not get to occupy these positions anymore. I am sorry. I don't care how young you were. I don't care what you were going through. You're supposed to cling to your spouse in order to get through and not get farther away. So what does the Bible actually say about divorce? Well, it says quite a bit. And unfortunately for people who think divorce is okay, it's not on your side. There are only two reasons given in scripture for divorce. But we'll get into those. First, I want to look at the positive affirmations of what the Bible says about marriage. So what is marriage supposed to actually be? What 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 should we expect out of marriage? What does God expect out of marriage? What does God say marriage is? Well, before we look at why the Bible says we can get divorced, we need to look at all the things that God says are beneficial about divorce, why he instituted marriage in the first place. So let's look at a few of those. Now, just heads up, we're going to be reading a lot of scripture, but that's okay. I know people are used to having the one-off one verse sermons or you pick a verse and then you go off on a tangent you talk about it forever you have a, a a daily bible study where we read one verse and then we're good and this is one reason 
among many reasons that divorce is so prevalent is because people don't take the time to actually read scripture in context in full to look at what it actually says. So we're going to start with Ephesians 5, 15 through 33. Uh, again, I'll throw it up on screen so you guys can read it while I follow along. So before I get to the wives and husbands part, I'm going to back up a little bit just so we can get a little extra content. Uh, so we can kind of catch the mood of what Paul is saying to the, the church in Ephesus. So starting in verse 15, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So before we even get to the wives and husbands section, we see that Paul is calling for unity. He's calling for a rebellion against sin, against debauchery and, and getting drunk with wine. He's telling people to be filled with the Spirit. And he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So we already see that Paul is setting up this idea that we need to find unity within the body of Christ. This isn't even talking about the marriage covenant of a man and woman. So this is the lead up. So we already know where Paul's going with this. So when you're reading this, think the last verse that we have there. He says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So if we are supposed to submit to each other in the body, then in the marriage, this is even more relevant. So let's continue in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wives loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So this is very important because this, I think out of any passage I read, shows that the relationship that a man has with his wife and a wife has with her husband is supposed to be the exact same as the relationship that Christ has with the church. So this isn't just something that people do. It's not just a a, a union that people do and they you know they do it so they can just have somebody in their lives or so they can feel good or or fulfill some kind of longing no marriage is supposed to be a representation of christ being married to his church so husbands your relationship with your wife is supposed to be the exact same as christ's relationship with his church now, if you know anything about scripture, you know, first off, from John 6, that Christ will not lose anybody that is given to him. He doesn't lose anybody in his, in his flock. None of his sheep will ever be lost. He has them forever. They can't be taken away. So when you divorce your wife or your wife divorces you, it's taking the picture of God where he is wedded with his church and it rips it apart and throws it away. So just as God's relationship with his people cannot and should never be broken in the same way a husband should never leave his wife and his wife should never leave the husband. Because if they do, it's the same thing as saying that God can be ripped apart from his church. It's impossible and it should not be the case. Okay, let's look at another passage. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So let me just stop real quick. That's kind of interesting. I want to read that again. It says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. 
when they see their respectful, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So that's kind of interesting. So if a wife sees their husband not following the world or sinning or or doing something that he's not supposed to be, you know, falling away or, you know, some people maybe talk about backsliding and, and falling away from the church and from God. It says that wives, the way you act, the way you are respectful and that you submit to him and that you follow God's word and the way that you act as an example, your, your behavior can bring your husband back to God. Now, nowhere in here does it say, well, you know, if your husband starts backsliding and he starts doing stuff you don't like and he's sinning and he's kind of being a, you know, being a jerk and, and he's doing things that you don't like, then you must not be any love anymore. You must not have the feelies for him. You must, you must not be soulmates. You, you were too young. You were A, B, C, X, Y, C, excuse one through three. It's just, it doesn't say that anywhere. No, what does it say? It says, win them with your conduct. Nowhere in here does it give you an excuse to divorce. And it would be the same way for husbands to the words their wives. Let's continue. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So Peter is saying in the same way, husbands, you're supposed to treat your wives the same way, because you're the head of the household, she's the weaker vessel, and you as the leader set the example. And if you fail, and setting that example, and then your wife has issues with her faith or her relationship with you. She, yes, she is supposed to be respectful and, and to try, you know, pray and, and to stay firm in the faith to win you back. But you're responsible too. You will suffer just as much judgment and then more because God has set you as the head of the household. You know, being the head of the household, this, this is really misunderstood. It doesn't just mean that you're in charge of the family. It means that you are responsible for the whole family. Whereas a wife or a child, yes, they are responsible for their own actions. You as the husband are responsible for your actions and their actions because you are the head of the household. That means that you are responsible. Not just you're in charge, not just you have all the power, not, oh, I'm the head so I get to say whatever I want. No, you are responsible and you will receive judgment for what you made them do that they will not receive. They won't receive the same judgment because they're not the head. You are. You need to take this into account, husbands, when you think about divorcing your wives, because you will suffer a much worse judgment on the day of judgment than they will. And if you think that you're going to sit before God and tell him that you divorced your wife because it just didn't work out, or we were just young, or we just weren't compatible, or we weren't soulmates, none of that's going to fly. He's going to say, yes, but what about you? I told you how you're supposed to handle your household, and you did not. So for clarification on this, when we read things in the New Testament about marriage, they often um, will allude to a reference, uh, like in the previous passage, where it says that a man should be, you know, uh, a man and a woman shall come together and be one flesh. Well, where does that come from? Well, it actually comes from Genesis. So Jesus is understanding and Paul and Peter and the rest of the New Testament writers, their understanding of marriage comes from the Old Testament, specifically from the book of Genesis. So let's look at Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Real quick, if you didn't know this, if you see the word Lord and it's in all capitals, it, it actually is Yahweh. So when it's translated into English, they, they don't say Yahweh, so they just put L-O-R-D in caps. So it's, it would be, so then the Lord God or Yahweh God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he could call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, as was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was found not but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, 
took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now that is such a foreign idea to people these days. The idea of one flesh. And you understand, when, when you say one flesh, you, we really need to think about the idea of one flesh. Now, my hand and my arm are one flesh. They are connected. It's connected at the, the wrist, and they move together. They work together. The muscles come up through here into my hand. Uh, there's tendons, and um, you know you can get uh, carpal tunnel in here, and there's all different things because there's small bones. It's connecting. But my hand and my arm work as one unit. And I can't separate them because they are one flesh. It's all part of my flesh. And if I want to separate my hand from my arm, I have to physically grab this hand and pull and rip it from my forearm. So I have to take and tear all those tendons, all those muscles, all the blood that's going through, all the skin on top, everything that connects them. I have to physically rip this off my body. Now, when you think about that, you think, that seems ridiculous. You can't do that, and why would you? Why would you do something like that? Because they're connected. They're obviously supposed to be. It's one flesh. It goes together. And that's the picture that is being painted here. You know, one flesh isn't just physical. Now, a lot of people think it is. Now, there is a physicality part to it. When you and your wife come together, you physically become one flesh uh, through intercourse. So there is a physical part to it. But this isn't the only thing that is in the mind of Moses when he's writing Genesis. And this isn't what Paul is thinking, or Peter in the New Testament. So it's not just one flesh physically, it's one flesh mentally, one flesh spiritually, one flesh motivationally, one flesh life goals, one flesh child. Because if you have a child like I do, you look down and that child is half you and half your spouse. So that child is one flesh that comes from both of you. So both of you, in a way, your one flesh has has uh, made itself out in the form of a child. So one flesh isn't just about intercourse. It's not just about intimacy. It's the idea that they cannot be taken apart. I mean, just listen to the way he says this. He says, then the man said, so this is Adam speaking after God has given him Eve. He says, this at last is bone of my bone so literally quite literally a bone taken out of him so physically she is a piece of him and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man and that is the same way you should look at your spouse especially husbands especially husbands okay because <laughs> I, let me go on a little rant here for a second. I, when I hear men who are talking about divorce in the Christian church, who claim to be Christians, or men who are talking about other people that they know who are getting divorces, and they support them, or they say those stupid things, like, wow, well, they just were young. Well, it wasn't meant to be. Well, at least they don't have kids. Well, it would be better if they got out now. Well, they didn't know what they were doing. Well, that was this and that was that. That stuff freaking infuriates me. And it infuriates God. Okay, you need to understand something. Like I said, husbands, if you're divorcing your wife, you're going to stay in a judgment on God. And you're going to stay in a judgment of yourself and your family. But also, if you are out there and you're a Christian... And you're claiming that you represent Christ, and you represent God and His Word, and you're telling people it's okay for them to get divorced, and they ask you, well, is it okay? And you say yes, you are going to have quite the time standing in front of Jesus Christ and the Father on the Day of Judgment. And you have to sit there and tell Him that you sold somebody else, especially if they're not a non-believer, if they're a non-believer and they're not a Christian, and you told them and you affirmed to them that it's okay for them to get divorced... You have some hellfire coming your way, my friend. 
I would be living in fear every single day of my life until I repented. My advice to you would be to fall on your face and beg God for repentance right now. That is unacceptable. God is not okay with the divorce. The reason he gives people the right to divorce is because of their hardness of heart. People do not get divorced because the person isn't their soulmate. That's not why. They don't get divorced because they just haven't gotten along. Well, we're two different people. Well, we were young. That, that has nothing to do with it. The reason people get divorced is because of sin. They are sinful. They are sinful, they are greedy, and they are prideful. And they look at their spouse and they say to them, you are not giving me what I need for me to be 100% happy. So it's greedy and it's prideful and it's arrogant. And so if you look at your spouse and you say, well, I'm not happy because you have done a, B, C, X, Y, Z. That is your fault. That's your problem. It's not your spouse's problem. Now, you may have some issues between you and your spouse, and your spouse may be doing some things wrong. I'm not saying that. But there is no such thing as a one-sided divorce. One-sided divorces do not exist. There's no such thing as a one-sided affair. Even if there is an affair, and somebody is obviously at fault and they get caught, people don't just wake up one day and say to themselves, Man... My marriage flipping rocks. I'm going to cheat on my wife today. That has literally never happened in the history of mankind. But I know some of you might be thinking out there saying, well, what does Jesus think about divorce? Well, what does he think about marriage? Does he say anything about marriage? Well, what, what does he think about men and women coming together? Well, he actually answers this very question, and he does so quite ironically, providentially, probably because he knew this was going to come up because he could see the future. In Matthew 19, he's actually asked about divorce, and he responds, and he quotes Genesis 2. So let's look at it. So Matthew 19, starting at verse 1. Now when Jesus had finished these things, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking. Now understand real quick, the Pharisees, they don't actually want to hear an answer they're there so they can try to get him they're trying to stick it to him they've been trying for a while to get him arrested and to get the crowds to turn against him so they're coming at him they're saying well you know the law says this very legalistic well the law says it well you know so they're doing that legalism thing well if it says this and then you know and then they try to spin it and jesus he he does his jesus thing the pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause he answered have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So quoting Genesis 2, because obviously Jesus is the one who made man and woman in the book of Genesis. He's the one who created everybody. So he's quoting essentially himself. Uh, verse 6, So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So obviously Jesus doesn't like divorce. Anything that has been joined together should not be separated, especially if they become one flesh. And Jesus' understanding of marriage is rooted in the book of Genesis very literally. Verse 7, they said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? So you see what they're doing, they're trying, they're proof texting. A lot of people do this. Well, you know, the Bible says that you can get divorced. I mean, Moses said it was okay, you know, and they look for all these things. So you, you throw away 95% of the Bible in order to find that 5% that really pushes your position across. So you can say, well, I just this 5% says it's okay, and then you ignore the other 95%. Well, Jesus doesn't let them get away with that. He said to them, verse 8, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. So if you divorce your spouse for any reason except for sexual immorality, you are committing adultery. And not only are you committing adultery, you are making your divorce spouse commit adultery with the next person that they marry so you've committed adultery your spouse has committed adultery 
And then your new spouse and your ex-spouse's new spouse are now committing adultery. So it's not just divorce. Well, it's not just it didn't work out. No, you've made four people commit adultery from your one act of sin and your hardness of heart. Verse 10. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. So it's interesting what the Bible say, or the, I'm sorry, it's interesting what the disciples say. If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Now, why would they say that? And why would the Pharisees say that? Well, it was very common uh, in the first century for, for Jews, for Pharisees to leave their wives. And even in the Old Testament, it was very, um, well, I can't remember the reference off the top of my head, but Jewish people were leaving their wives, their Jewish wives, for younger Gentile pagan wives. They said, well, you know, with Moses said we could do it. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the, you know, the Torah. It's in the law, the Pentateuch, whatever you want to call it. And so the disciples are saying, well, they, having been under the uh, the leadership and the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees for years before Jesus came on the scene and they became his disciples, they would have been under this idea, too, that, well, Moses said so, so it's okay. So even the disciples, the ones directly under Jesus, have been confused like this. And that's kind of where we're at today. I mean, if you look out and you see the organized Western church, they kind of have the same idea that the Pharisees do. They'll say things like, well, divorce isn't preferred in marriage, but it happens. Well, you know, divorce isn't isn't really what we want, but, that, you know, sometimes that's just the way it goes. Well, you know, the Bible says that you can do it for this, and they just look for reasons and excuses, and they proof text their way through sin, and it's just disgusting, and it's just offensive to me and to God. And to regenerate Christians, to hear people spin and support this ignorant rhetoric as if it's something that God is with, that God supports them. Well, I know people who are getting divorced and they're not Christians. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're not Christians. It doesn't matter if they're Muslims or atheists or agnostics or Hindus or Jainists. I don't care what they are. God is still in charge, and whatever he says goes. I don't care what religion they are or what the religion they aren't. As a Christian, it is your job to support their needs biblically, to be there for them, to teach them what the Word of God says. Not to say, well, you know, sometimes it doesn't just work out. It just happens like that. No, it doesn't just happen like that. It doesn't happen like that. It happens like that because people are sinful, and you need to show them that. So then people ask, because of course people are always looking for an outlet to sin. Well, well, what is the only reason that people can get divorced? Well, there is one reason. Well, there's two reasons, but one explicit one, and, and we'll get into that. This, this is a pretty good article. Um, it's in Christianity Today. Again, I'll put the link up in the description below, or I'll put it somewhere up here in the bubble so you can go read it. But I like what is found here. So in the middle of the article, um, probably about almost about, a little bit less than halfway down, yeah, there's a, a heading. It says explicit divorces allowances or explicit divorce allowances. So let me just read through this real quick. The Bible only explicitly allows divorce for two reasons. Kostenberger, who is also the president of Biblical Foundations, summarizes. Jesus proceeded to state one exception in which case divorce is permissible. Sexual immorality on the part of one's spouse. That is, in context, adultery. So Matthew 19.9, he's referencing that. Kostenberger clarifies. In such a case, however, divorce is not mandated or even encouraged. Forgiveness and reconciliation should be extended and pursued if at all possible. But divorce is allowed, especially in cases where the sinning spouse persists in an adulterous relationship. So we see here that Mr. Uh, Kostenberger has given us the, the one explicit uh, allowance for divorce in scripture and that is adultery so if your spouse has an affair on you you are within your right legally i mean scripturally legally you can divorce them because god does give us an allowance for this but kostenberger I, I like the way he says it it says in such cases however divorce is not mandated 
or even encourage. So even if your spouse does have an affair, the first thing you should not do is immediately file for a divorce. Because like I said before, scripture gives us the real reason for a divorce. It's hardness of hearts. It's sin. And the reason for adultery is almost never one-sided. If your spouse gets to the point where they are having an affair, they are leaving you to go find something that they are missing in your relationship with another person this didn't just happen overnight. You know, I said in, earlier, people don't just wake up in an amazing marriage and decide they're going to have an affair all of a sudden. No, that has been building, sometimes for years. Maybe even several years, a decade. You know, if somebody you see these people who have been married 20, 30 years getting divorced, well, well, there was always an issue there, but a lot of times they stay together for the kids or the fact that children are in the home. You know, that, that issue kind of gets masked, you know, or... or it kind of gets, it's hidden, it's pushed down, suppressed. And so you don't really see the issues in your marriage bubbling up until the kids are gone. And all of a sudden you realize, we've had this issue the whole time. Well, then somebody after, you know, 20 years, you say, oh my gosh, how could they have an affair on me? Well, there was 20 years of issues between you that never got resolved. And it is both of your fault. Now, that doesn't excuse the person having the affair from any wrongdoing. No, they are still liable for, for their sin and they will be judged for that. But what Kostenberger is saying is that, that it's not optimal to to say, well, it was all their fault and file for the divorce. No, the, you should sit down and try to find out why. Why did why did we divorce? Why why has this happened? Why did what was it that I was not giving them that they felt so strongly about that they had to go and find another person to get that feeling from that that should be first so unless a person flat out just will not try to repair the marriage or um, like he says here persists in an adulterous relationship unless they are unwilling to come back and, and to reconcile with you and to go to counseling and things like that you should try to repair the marriage and, and this is kind of a spinning off. This is a little bit of a side note. But one, one way you can do that is if a person in an adulterous relationship refuses to repent, then you do what we see in the book of Matthew. You bring them before the elders. You bring them before two or three witnesses. And then if they will not recant, you bring them before the church. And if they come before the church and they still rec won't recant, then you throw them out of the church. That's the way it's supposed to be done. Not just, oh my gosh, I woke up, found out my husband or wife had an affair, immediately divorced, it's all their fault. No, it wasn't. It wasn't all their fault. Some of it was your fault. And I know that's hard to say. It's hard to hear. You know, it makes people uncomfortable because it is. Because usually when it gets to the point of an affair, there's already so much emotional tension between the two that this is just a tipping point. And then they, you know, sometimes you're even in denial. I can't believe they did this. I don't know why. But most of the time if you sit down go through counseling and talk it out with people, you can find out why. Now, there is a, a second reason that's not explicitly stated, but, but Paul brings it to us, and it's in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, continuing on with the article. Kostenberger goes on to note, Paul adds a second exception in instances where an unbelieving spouse abandons the marriage. This would typically be the case when one of the two partners is converted to Christ at some point after marrying, and the other person refuses to continue in the marriage. So this... Is a very unfortunate thing where you you get saved and your spouse has not gotten saved yet and your spouse just continues to to not be saved to, to not look at the evidence they just continually live in sin and you know they're continuing in it they're atheist or agnostic or whatever it is and they don't want to acknowledge christ as king if that person decides that they want to leave you you can't force them to to stay married to you because they're not part of the body of christ and to just stay married just for the sake of staying married if they don't want to. Now note that Paul doesn't say that if you as the married person want to divorce the non-believer that you have the right. You do not have the right. You have given up your prerogative to divorce them because you now are part of the body of Christ and you represent Christ. You represent the church. Everything I've read, Ephesians 5, 1 Peter, Genesis 2, Matthew 19, you embody all of those now. You do not have the right to divorce that person, but... If that person does want to divorce you and they just refuse to, to, to hear it out and to work it out, then, then so be it.
there is an exception for that. Now, a lot of times people will come up with things, well, what about domestic abuse? Uh, you know, what about extreme situations of, of violence and whatnot? And, and Kostenberger, uh, or uh, sorry, Keener, he, he does mention this. And uh, let me just read a little bit. He says, if a husband is beating his wife, that would certainly seem to violate the one flesh union. If he were beating himself, we would recommend psychiatric help. If he is beating his wife, who is supposed to be one flesh with him, he is certainly not treating her as one flesh. So again, if if there is physical abuse, obviously the first thing to do is, is to leave, right? To get out of there, get some physical space. If it's real bad, if there's kids involved, this obviously there's a lot of different ways that this can be handled. Police may have to get involved. Um, if you're part, you know, go see a pastor. You need to, you know, sometimes you may have to go into a shelter or go to a friend's house. Uh, there's a lot of different ways and we can't cover all of them. But obviously if domestic abuse is happening, that is a violation of your one flesh connection with your spouse. Now again, Keener, he says that I don't want this to be an excuse for people to get out of marriage. Even in the case of, of abuse, because there is still, there's still fault on both people's sides. And that's not a truth that's fun to hear. It's not. I mean, it, and unless it's a radical case where it's just a person, they get married and he just beats her for no reason. Or she beats him for no reason, you know, and that's all she has known and she's just constantly attacking him. You know, and for no, there's no provocation of any kind or there's drugs or alcohol involved. Obviously, there's there's many many different ways you can look at this but the heart of the message of Christ is forgiveness and grace and we go back and we look at what we see in 1st Peter 3 wives win your husbands over with respect and by adorning yourself in a respectful and honorable manner so even if your husband is beating you or husbands if your wife is beating you you want to win them over with your respectable attitude the way you act the way you present yourself if this is not going to be popular but if you if there's physical abuse by one or both sides in a marriage then most likely you have not been presenting yourself in a Christ-like manner to that person now I you can't obviously there's lots of different variables that lead into this but sin is on both sides and it, just divorce is not the answer divorce should be the very last place that our marriages go when they're in trouble you should try every single avenue you have within your family your friends your church counseling psychiatry if some of you you know you might need there might be medication that's needed or you might need to sit down on a couch and talk to somebody you may need to sit down with your pastors bring people before the church there's so many different avenues that people can go down before they get to divorce because divorce is hated by God. He hates it. It is a violent offense to him. It, he looks on it with just a repugnant hate. And if the church cannot be separated from Christ, and our relationship with our spouse is supposed to be like that relationship that Christ has with the church, ripping it apart should be almost impossible, if not impossible. That's where we should end up. And when I, I know, and that's not popular, but let me give you an example of when somebody has had an affair and it has actually turned out better for both of them. And it has not only, not the affair, but the aftermath, the forgiveness, the, the grace, the, the wife's ability to, to come back and reconcile with her husband. How many people do you think have been inspired by that? How many marriages and relationships have been saved because of this woman and her husband's ability to work through their issues, their sin, the adultery, the the secrets and the lies, and to come together and to represent Christ. Uh, I got to give credit to my wife on this one. Uh, she told me about this lady. Her name is Lisa, and I'm gonna birch this. Turkirst, Turkirst, Turkirst. I'll I'll put it. 
I'll put it some. It'll. I'll put the the description somewhere or the link. But she has a truly amazing story. Now I'm just gonna read a little bit. Of this um, this website's called foreverymom.com/slash/marriage. That's kind of interesting. And Lisa Tierker is is writing a new book, and it she talks about how her husband had an affair with her, and how they reconciled their relationship and were able to stay married and come back together. So let me just read a part of this. In her new book, it's not supposed to be this way. That's fitting. Find unexpected strength when disappointment leaves you shattered. The Proverbs 31 Ministries founder finds a beautiful truth that is redemption even without complete restoration, something that has been pivotal in the rebuilding of her marriage. She tells Bush Hager, we are both doing the hard work of reconciliation, which means daily pursuing togetherness, something Turkier says she's extremely thankful for. There's a big difference between complete restoration and redemption. She continues, Redemption can be ours today even before the complete restoration and reconciliation has happened. Something she says her and Art, her husband, are both pursuing in a spiritual and emotional sense as well as a relational sense. Being the founder and president of one of the nation's largest women's ministries, faith has always been the foundation for Turkey's life. But how does one of the most influential women in the church keep the faith when life shatters everything you've ever known? She opens up to Dylan Dreyer with this little nugget of truth. My faith in God allows me to elevate my perspective beyond just what we can see, she says. So there's a story that we see, but then there's a story that we tell ourselves. And I think that the story that we tell ourselves determines so much about the pathway that we're going to head in. It's either going to be one of brokenness and bitterness, or it's going to be one of restoration and redemption. Turkier says that although she couldn't choose the circumstances of her story, she has been able to choose redemption. So much of that is because of the goodness and the forgiveness God has given me, she says. It is impossible to forgive another person unless you really understand how deeply you've been forgiven. My relationship with God allows me to see I've been forgiven of much, therefore I can certainly forgive. You know, it. she hits it on the head so much when she says, when I think about how much I've been forgiven, it allows me to forgive even a horrible sin like adultery by my husband. Because one thing that happens is that people have such a low view of sin in their lives. They say, well, yeah, I've been saved. Yes, God saved me, you know, from sin and from hell and all that. That's a very cookie cutter surface level understanding of sin. But what Lisa is saying is that my sin is so great that in comparison to my husband's sin, what Christ has done for me is so much more that I can find it within myself to forgive my husband of adultery because my sin is no less gross and horrid in the sight of God than my husband's sins are in my eyes. I don't even know what to say. I can't say it better than she said it myself. She absolutely nailed it. So in closing, divorce is unacceptable. It is absolutely unacceptable, Christians. It is not allowed. There's two exceptions, but those are at the very end. And the vast majority of people that get divorced are nowhere near those exceptions. And even if you are at that, that one or two small variable exceptions where the Bible says it's okay, it's still not preferred. Forgiveness should always be paramount. If you can reconcile with your husband or with your wife, you should do everything within your power to do that first. You know, it reminds me of Hosea in the Old Testament. And he marries a prostitute. She goes out, leaves him, leaves the family, does all this promiscuous stuff. And God tells Hosea to go back and get her. She was the ultimate cheater, the ultimate in adultery. And yet God still says, forgive her. And that is because it was uh, a picture of of God and the way Israel has treated him. You know, we have done no less to God than an adulterous spouse has done to their spouse. Our sin is disgusting in his eyes, but he has forgiven us of all of it. And if God can find it in himself to forgive sinners like you and me, you should find it in yourself to forgive 
your spouse for whatever they've done. And if possible, come back together as one flesh so that you can reflect and represent God to an unbelieving world and an unbelieving generation. I hope this has helped, guys. If you like this kind of video or if you like what you've heard here, uh, let me know down in the comments below what you think about the video. If you want me to cover any other topics, let me know. I really, I really enjoy these Christian critique videos because, like I said, I could spend so much more time on them. And I have my, you know, my reformed reviews, and they're kind of short and and bittersweet sometimes. And it's just me kind of reacting candidly to to things that happen. So you know, five ten minute videos. And then I have my eating and critiquing videos where I, you know, just put horrible food in my mouth. And it just, it's such a bummer for me. But it's funny, you know, I, I enjoy I laugh at it when it's done. But when I'm doing it, it's such a bummer. But, you know, there's, in that, it's it's for satire. It's sarcastic. You know, it's for entertainment value. So I am trying to reach people in those videos. But there's only so much that I can say or do. But But in a video like this, I can really sit down and I have time to go through and explain it and delve because you you need context and that that's lacking so much today where you just get a verse here or a video there and it's five minutes here it's five minutes there and you don't take time to look through the scriptures and to actually talk it out and think about it and let it reverberate and and to spend time fleshing out the issues that that really need to be looked at so uh, like i said if you like what you've seen let me know uh, if you want me to look at anything else or if you you don't like what i think or you don't agree with what I've said, uh, feel free to respond. Maybe make another video. Um, that's really kind of something that I, I love that the internet gives us the ability to do. And I love that YouTube allows us to do that. Is that anybody can put up a video, a response video. And so if you don't like what I've said, or you don't agree with what I've said, I'd love to have a response video. You know, just, just put the link down below or uh, send it to me in a message or something. And I'll watch it and I'll respond to that as well. And maybe we can get a dialogue going and we can help people even in our disagreement. We can find some common ground, and that common ground is scripture. Uh, so subscribe to my channel if you like what you see. That would really help. Um, comment down below, like this video, and again, if you don't like it, dislike it. That's fine, too. All right, thanks for tuning in, guys. See you later.